Good morning, friends. Welcome to our March twentieth Sunday morning service. So nice of you to join us online, and we have our in-person service going on at ten thirty as well. How about we we take a moment before we formally begin our service, have a quiet reflection as we read our call to worship, and then from the call to worship, as we then sing our invocation song, where we call upon the name. Of the Lord. Our call to worship passage is taken from Psalm 18, verse 46. That is Psalm 18, verse 46. And it reads The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. Jesus is alive today, friends, and his presence is what we need a visit from this morning. Amen. How about we take a moment of quiet? And we'll call on His name as the presence of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God, to be with us this morning. Our invocation song is, O Lord, how beautiful is the place of your feet. And I I sang it incorrectly last week, so so I hope it's not too shocking to everyone. This is the authentic version, and we'll be singing it in just a moment here. O Lord, how beautiful is the place of your feet, where we bow down to meet at your throne. O Lord, how beautiful just to look on your face and to rest in the grace you have shown. O Lord, it's beautiful, oh, so beautiful, As in spirit and in truth we bring our praise to you. O Lord, it's beautiful just to worship you in the beauty of your holiness and power. And O Lord, how beautiful is the place of your feet where we bow down to meet at your throne. O Lord, how beautiful just to look on your face and to rest in the grace you have shown. O Lord, it's beautiful Oh, so beautiful, as in spirit and in truth we bring our praise to you. Oh, Lord, it's beautiful just to worship you in the beauty of your holiness and power. Would you lift your voices with me? Praise you, Lord. Worship you, Jesus. How about we pray? Almighty and holy God, our Father which art in heaven, Holy Jesus, Holy Spirit, be with us, O Lord, today. And we ask your presence, the habitation of thy house, Lord, that you would be with your saints this morning. We praise you, O God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, what a wonderful Sunday morning service online, in person. So happy for you to be with us today. I have two special announcements that I will also be in our little announcement reel, but I want to make special mention of them. Many of us know, I think are aware, that the official mask mandate is ending on March the 21st, which is Monday. And the board, we've been we discussed it for quite some time, actually, over, over the months, what we would do, and of course, praying 
their own time, etc., and things like this. And we've come to the decision that the next Sunday, March the 27th, we've phrased it like this, mask wearing will be optional for the in-person service. If you feel like that's something you need, the Lord is leading you in that direction, you'd like to wear a mask, by all means, continue. We encourage that. We encourage people to make their own decisions. We feel that we don't need to wear the mask at this point for whatever reason, we don't want to, then in God's house, in accordance with the laws of this country as well, you are free to not wear your mask. Should, of course, the situation uh, change, <laughs> then we will adapt to the change. Amen. And look forward to some announcements on programming that are coming. We, we have some things down the pipe, not just the watch care and some other stuff and the songs of story, which which we're going to, that's, that's coming out too, but we got some other stuff coming too. So exciting for you all to participate in the Shiloh Church life. So without further ado, let's move on to the rest of our announcements and then our first reading of scripture, followed by two hymns of worship. Our first reading of scripture comes from Psalm 63. The title of this psalm is, My Soul Thirsts for You. This psalm speaks of the mystery of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How, by his right hand, God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. Truly, in the shadow of the wings of our Father, we can always find rest and joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our reading begins with the following words. O God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live, in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. May we find rest under the loving kindness and power of God our Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. Please. 
Our second reading of scripture continues from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 5. In the Old Testament, God's prophets were sent as messengers of mercy to remind God's people to live the lives they were called to live. Though, at times it may feel challenging, Isaiah reminds us that God never leaves us without help. Let us encourage ourselves and take heart as we read this biblical warning against wandering away from God's call on our lives. Our reading continues with the following words. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry." 
May we be encouraged this day to follow Jesus, our Lord and Savior. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. To Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. Live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my bless. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Humble at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Lord, Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. My blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Now I feel that blessed flame. Oh, the joy of full salvation. Glory, glory to His name. I surrender all. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the land. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the land. Would you be willing for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would 
you live daily as praises to sing There's wonderful power in the blood There is power, power, wonderful thing power in the blood of the Lamb There is power, power, wonderful thing power in the precious blood of the Lamb It is now our watch care time, and we are reading this morning. My wife will be reading from uh, the story of the Tower of Babel, and uh, our watch care question from last week, which is number six in our list. I'll put it up on the screen there for all of us to consider. How does God rescue you from the way of sin and death? And the hint for that is John 3.16 and Romans 3.23. To 26, Romans 3, 23 to 26. The way of death, the way of sin and death, the Bible says, well, the wages of sin are death. We are all mortal. We are presently on <laughs> the way of death, so to speak. Every one of us depends on our perspective, of course. But the Lord has made a way for us to change directions, to change paths. There is a narrow way. There is a straight gate, and it's the gate of Jesus the Nazarene. And our short answer to that question, how do we get off the way of death, is he rescues me through believing in Jesus Christ, whomsoever believes. Believes. We are rescued by our believing in Jesus Christ. What a powerful and hopeful testimony. A lot of things just depend on perspective, emphasis, and our preconceived notions. Things are either negative or positive, depending on how we spin them. And I believe the spin on this is positive. For God so loved the whole world. It's the love of God. That's the spin we're dealing with. The love of God that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have life everlasting. Amen, my friends. How about we move from our watch care time to those who are doing the questions (laughs) to, to now the story time. And we'll be having that read to us in a moment. Good Sunday morning, everyone. Welcome to our Watch Care Time. We're reading from the Read With Me Bible, NIRV Bible Storybook, illustrated by Dennis Jones. Again, we're continuing in the Old Testament. Today, we're learning about the Tower of Babel. Do you see a tower in this picture? There's a pretty big tower there. There's a guy bringing some bricks to make it even bigger. He has a puppy in the back there helping him out. Okay, let's start reading. Genesis 11. The whole world had only one language. That means they could all understand each other and what they were saying to each other. The men said to each other, Let's build a tower that reaches to the sky. We'll make a name for ourselves. Then we won't be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Hmm, what are these guys thinking? They're thinking that if they work really hard together, they can do something really, really, really amazing. But the problem here is that they're not thinking about God or doing something good for God. They're thinking about only themselves. Hmm, that's not so good, is it? But the Lord came down to see the city and the big tower the men were building. What did the Lord say? He did something. All of them speak the same language. Now they'll be able to do anything they plan to. Let us mix up their language. Then they will not understand each other. Do you see all those men there? They look pretty confused. They're trying to talk to each other, but it's kind of funny because they don't understand each other. One guy could be speaking English. One guy could be speaking French. One guy could be speaking Mandarin. It's 
pretty, pretty funny. So the Lord scattered them from there over the whole earth. That means God separated them over the whole earth. And they stopped building the city. The Lord mixed up the language of the whole world there. And that's why the city was named Babel. Hmm, that's pretty funny, isn't it? Can you understand your brothers and sisters or your friends? Imagine if all of a sudden you couldn't understand each other. Hmm. What are the important things we can take from this story? Number one, people got together to make a tower to show that by their own strength, they could reach God. Could they reach God? No, we can't do anything by our own strength. But no matter how big we get, we always need God's help. We should never think we don't need God's help. You kids will grow. You'll get really big one day. But you always need to remember that no matter how big you are, you always need God's help. Now, how can you ask for God's help? Maybe if you're in trouble or you're having a hard time learning your letters or your numbers or something, how can you ask for God's help? Well, for one, I always like to pray when I need God's help. So you can remember to pray too. And you can pray anywhere you are. When you're in school, when you're at home, no matter where you are, you can always pray. And you can ask for God's help when you're having a hard time. That has been our Watch Care program for this week. We've been reading from the Read With Me Bible, NIRV Bible Storybook, illustrated by Dennis Jones. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you next time. Take care. Well, friends, it is now time for our third reading of Scripture and our lesson, our, our message to come from that text. will be in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 to 9, and we're talking about God's mercy. Now, this parable, it is a parable, a symbolic story, is maybe an atypical example of God's mercy, but that all depends on our perspective when we approach the text. We need to let our eyes and our lenses be colored with the overall context. And the overall context of this passage is the story of God's love for the whole world. You see, we're celebrating the season of Lent, which is the period leading up to Good Friday, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and Easter Sunday where our Lord, He rises again from the dead. And what is a sad story? He's betrayed by, by one of His friends. He suffers, he is whipped, he's beaten, he's crucified on a cross. It is actually a happy story of triumph and victory, such that it is called good news. And that's the mystery of redemption. That's the power of the cross. It takes our sin, no matter how great it is, no matter how bad it is, and it turns it into something good. A cause of rejoicing and praise to God. Everyone who is a sinner, on account of our sin and our salvation, who comes to know Jesus Christ, we praise God because of what He's done for us. Our sin goes from an object of horror and evil to something of joy, thanksgiving, and praise. That's, that's the gospel story. And today we're going we're gonna to be reading a very interesting parable in Luke chapter 13. It's the parable of the, of the barren fig tree. Jesus tells a story about a, a tree that is not bearing fruit. And there's a discussion on whether to cut down this tree, a judgment. Maybe it's how we would interpret that. But it's left open-ended. Because indeed, the time of judgment is not today. It is the open-ended era of mercy, which we soon shall see. How about we take a look here. Luke chapter 13, verses 1 to 9, the English Standard Version. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. 
And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What, what's happened at this point? Well, Jesus, he's, he's standing there, and some people come up to him, and they, it seems they're bringing a case of insurrection before him. The governor, Pilate, he's come down hard on some Galileans. It appears when they were in a period of worship, he came and he fell upon them and he killed them. And we're going to assume this is some sort of judicial matter. And it seems that they believe these Galileans deserved what came to them. And that's how we understand Jesus' answer. He says, do you suppose that they were worse sinners? Meaning that these people are saying, look, these Galileans, wicked, they suffered karma. And they are prideful, perhaps, assuring themselves, well, we are not like these Galileans. Jesus is addressing that. Let's continue. Verse 4. He gives another example. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? Rhetorically, these people do think so. But Jesus gives the truth. No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Wow. And he told this parable. He's going to reinforce his point. He's going to build. He's going to tell them something. Because Jesus doesn't just leave us on that negative note. He gives us the positive spin of God's love. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Oh my. And he said to the vine dresser, look for three years. Now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree that's seeking continually. And I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. How about we pray before we go further, ask the Lord for his anointing and his grace. And let's talk about this, this powerful, his mercy endures forever. That's where we're going with this. His mercy endures forever. Let's take a look here. Almighty God, we praise you. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. That's what the psalm says. It never ceases. You are faithful. Your mercy, your loving kindness, your grace. It is truly enough. We thank you, O God, and we ask for it this morning. We ask that you would anoint my tongue, my mouth, and our ears and our hearts, our eyes, our hearts, our spiritual eyes, that we may hear and see what thou, Holy Spirit, are saying to us this morning through the holy word of thy Son, O Father, Jesus Christ. We praise you, O God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this is kind of the situation of the parable. We should understand it, and then we're going to jump into our points. There's a, there's a key issue I want to address here that comes from it. So we have these people, they come to Jesus. And they're essentially saying, karma. I, not that I believe in karma. I don't think we should as Christians. We don't. We don't believe in it. We believe in grace. We don't believe people get what they deserve. Amen. There's mercy. There's love. There's compassion. There's another color to the world. There's another law. It's not just punishment. There's love, there's mercy, there's grace. But I, I speak in this worldly way because I, I, it's a spirit that we as believers need to not have. So these people, they come, they say, karma, Jesus. These Galileans, they had their blood mingled with their sacrifices. They did something. And Jesus rebukes the spirit, the intent, the heart that that comes from, the pride. They got what they deserved. Jesus says, do you suppose you are better than them. Not saying they didn't get what they deserve, by the way. Not saying they did not get what they deserve, by the way. But adding to it, do you think that you deserve a better fate? Do you think that you deserve a better fate? And he gives them another example. Do you think those 18, they must have known about this incident, those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell, that they were worse offenders than all in Jerusalem? These people obviously thought, yeah. <laughs> they were worse offenders. <laughs> they deserved it. We delight when a star falls from heaven. We delight in the gossip. When someone falls, 
when someone gets what we perceive that they deserve. And Jesus says we should not delight, but we should receive instruction. And we should think that's, that's going to happen to me if not for the grace of God, if not for the love of the mercy of God, if not for that new color in this life, if not for something special and different, the wages of sin is death, and truly we all get there. Now this is the idea I want to address, the key point. All sin separates us equally from God. All sin makes us not worthy. The wages of sin, period, is death. But sin is not equal in depravity. This is very clear. Sin is not equal in depravity. There are some sins that are worse than others. You do some things, and yes, we incur punishments. We incur judgment. We incur justice. We, we talk about communion. You can sin against communion. We read it last time during our communion time. And so the, the sins are not equal in degree. But we don't think from that perspective because they are irrelevant in the light of the mercy of God. The degree of sinfulness is, is truly irrelevant because it only seeks to speak of the mercy of God. The blood of Jesus, the cross has to move just as far for one who is a hundred times a sinner and one who is one. You see, for the Almighty, a distance to cross a hundred steps to get one lost sheep is just as much effort as to go one step to find a sheep that has just lightly strayed from the way. Our degree of lostness is swallowed up in the infinite mercy and love of God which never ceases. Whether we are near or far, He is near to each one of us. All of us equally are sinners, some indeed greater degrees than others, but God's love, because it's infinite, it goes just as far, no matter our sin. That's the great mercy of God. It's humbling. It's humbling. We all need Jesus just as much, and He goes just as far for each of us. Sometimes we fancy we're greater sinners. God had to go even farther. It is not so, because He's Almighty. And 100 steps is just as many as one to the Almighty God. His love and His mercy, it never ceases. And Jesus, He wants to cement this point, the necessity of repentance and the universal nature of God's love, that He gives us space. He gives us time. He tells the parable of the barren fig tree. Now this is addressed to those there that He's been ministering to, but it is addressed time immemorial. It is addressed to all of us until Jesus returns again. Because the parable talks about a judgment where Jesus will come and he will judge his church. He will judge his vineyard. He will judge his world. And that's not happened yet. Amen. So this parable still applies today. It still speaks truthfully today. And it doesn't apply just to all the people of God, but to us individually in our own lives. And what is the nature of the parable? Jesus says that there was a man who planted a vineyard and he had a fig tree. And he came to his fig tree seeking fruit. The Lord, he created the world. He created the earth. And on the earth, he put his witness. God's people, Israel, the church today. He put God's people on the earth. And he came seeking fruit from his own. He came to his own. But they did not receive him. They rejected him. His love, his gifts of love, they, they used them for their own ends. They were using up the ground. And they gave nothing. They were not a shining light. They were, not, they were not showing God the love and they were not giving Him the praise. Amen. They were joyless in their following of God. And so the Lord said, the time has come. It's time to cut it down. The mercy, it is not working. It's not working. And a servant who intercedes, it's, it's, it's kind of the opposite heart of those standing there in a way. The servant, he intercedes. The, the laborer, the, the vine dresser, the gardener, he intercedes and he says, Lord, leave it alone. Oh, your mercy never ceases. Leave it alone. I know there's been no change. I know they haven't repented. I know that they've remained the same. Their hearts are cold towards you and indifferent. I know. I know, but I ask for even more mercy and grace. I ask that you let me dig in and fertilize it with manure. Let me lay in something good. These are mighty works. These are miracles of God. You see, God's people, we grow up around the preaching of the gospel. We grow up around the word. And then sometimes we have the mighty works of God. Amen. And you can look back at your memory. You can think of the great revivals. I was just talking with my wife a few moments ago. I remember a time I was, I was slain in the spirit. I remember a time, well, I speak in tongues now. I remember many mighty works of God. 
in my life, in my family. And I'm sure we all, we can, we can remember and know many mighty works of God. And they're testimonies to us of what God has done in our life. I think especially of a time when, when I was drifting. And I grew up in a Christian home. I was, I was the, I was the fig tree with no fruit. I, I grew up in a Christian home and, and, and I remember I went off to college and, and, and I came home and, and my mom, she had a dream and she saw me smoking outside and, and she described the place. She described where I was. She said, I saw you in my dream, but she wasn't there. Only the Lord was there. That was a mighty work. And that convicted me, that brought, that brought fruit in my life. That's what the servant is asking for. I'm going to put some manure. I want to tell them that the Lord, he liveth today. The Lord liveth and blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of my salvation. God does things today. Amen. Maybe that will soften their hearts, the mighty works of God. How sad it is that when our Lord and Savior did the mightiest work of all, when he rose from the dead, the Pharisees, the pleasant planting of God, the men of Judah, his people, his people, when they heard of the resurrection said, well, let's, let, let's spread a false report about it. Let's not let it happen. And we look and say, well, we wouldn't do that. But amen, don't we? Don't we deny the works of God? Don't we minimize faith? Don't we look down sometimes on the workings of the Holy Spirit and on the grace and the mercy of God in this life? Do we really move forward in our faith and our love of God every day, one point? Do we realize the mercy of God never ceases? It's limitless. In the parable, it ends without the tree being cut down. It's open-ended. There's a judgment. There's a judgment coming. One day Jesus will return, but it's open-ended. What's going to take place on that day? Today, if we harden not our hearts, that's how the Bible puts it, harden not your heart, harden not your heart, repent. Hear what God is calling you to do. Listen to His voice. Amen. And you will bear fruit. You will bear fruit. And the fruit that the Lord is seeking, Jesus is explicit in it. He says that He names it in another place in John 4. And He names it also at the end of this chapter. He longs to gather us into his arms, intimacy, fellowship with God. In John 4, Jesus says the Father is seeking true worshipers who will worship in spirit and truth. That was our invocation song. As in spirit and in truth, we bring our praise to you. He's looking for genuine hearts that truly love him because he wants to spend forever with you, church. Do you want to spend forever with him? And we can't hide from those eyes. We can't hide from those eyes, amen. But it's, it's a positive spin. Because today is the day Jesus came to say, we can be there forever with him. We can. For God so loved the world, he gave you Jesus. He gave you the cross. There is no end to the mercy of God. Do not think that it's too late. The Lord, he intervenes in our lives so often. He does mighty works. He does testimonies. He does healings. I've seen healings with my own. He does things. And if we don't change when the mighty works come, we're missing out on the mercy. The mercy is limitless, but the time frame is allotted. There isn't a lot of time frame. The Father has fixed epochs. That's how the Bible calls them. Time frames by His own authority. Jesus speaks of this age and the age to come. There are different ages, and we are right now in an age of endless mercy and grace. Your sin, no matter how great, the cross is bigger. Your problem, your mountain, your tree, whatever it is that is preventing you, it is moved by faith in the name of Jesus. Do you hear that this morning? By faith in the name of Jesus, His grace, that's what the song says, it is truly enough. His love, it never changes. His yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Today, my friends, is the day of salvation. Do you realize how much God loves you? I want to close with a little anecdote. I, I, I remember when, when we were moving into this house, when my father-in-law, he was building this house. I helped a bit. Not a whole lot. You know, he gave me a hammer one day. And then he's like, Joel, how about instead you move some 
some plywood from point A to point B. Why don't you do that instead? I, I'm not a tradesman. I got, I got, key, I got type in hands, you know. I'm, a, I'm a keyboard warrior, so to speak. I, I, but I don't mind. I, I've improved over the time, and I got it. Anyways, moving on. So I was, I was helping with the house sometimes, and also helping with with colors and stuff. They were asking colors, but not so much with the colors. I was uh, mostly my wife was consulted for that. And finally, my turn came to suggest a color. For the house. All right. My, my turn came to suggest a color for the house. And they said, Jail, what color would you like? You get to choose the door. And my house, if you've been to it, we've got a nice kind of, I don't know what to call it, like a beachy theme. We've got some grayy, bluey thingy going on. It's very nice, very light, kind of airy colors. And and I, I was like, I want an orange door. I want an orange door. And if you see my door, I'm the house with the orange door. That's what I am right now. I don't have a number. I'm the house with the orange door. That color, that splash of bright color, it changed everything. It changed the appearance of the house. They had regret <laughs> in giving me the, the, that choice. But that's the point I want to bring to you. In this life of, of karma, of law, punishment, people get what they deserve. This, this, this life. There's a splash of grace. There's a new color. There's an orange door of salvation. There's something that changes the look of everything, and it's the love of God. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. It is the symbol by which when he is lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. All human beings are drawn to the cross of Jesus Christ. In this whole world, it's the unique. It's the stand apart. It's the different. It's the symbol of true faith. The cross. Of Jesus Christ. Are you this morning attracted to that Jesus of Nazareth, that man from Galilee? He died for your sins. And if that color, if that puts a positive tint on this message to you, that Jesus died for your sins, then he is calling you out of the world and into his grace. He's calling you out of darkness into marvelous light. He's saying, would you be free today? And just as I am, I come. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. Would you come forward where you are this morning to Jesus Christ today? How about we pray? Give your life to Jesus now and forevermore. Let's pray and then we'll do our doxology. We'll close our service. Almighty God, we praise you and we thank you. Holy is your name. Holy is your name. And we would like to approach. But who may dwell on the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. So wash my hands with the water. Not the water that Pilate used. But the water that comes from the side of Christ. And wash my heart. Wash it with thy blood. Forgive thy saint. Thy servant. Forgive us, O Lord, of our manifold wickedness. And receive us as lost lambs into thy bosom, we pray. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. If you prayed that prayer, you are a believer in Jesus Christ. If you're recommitting your life to Jesus, you just praise him. How about we sing this praise song, this doxology, to close off our service. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Another trifold amen. 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 Praise you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. It's time for the benediction. It's a simple message. It's a very simple message. His mercy endures forever. And today is the day to receive that endless mercy. We need it every day. Every hour I need thee. That's the hymn. We need him all the time. 
it's not a bad thing. We all need Him equally, no matter how great a sinner. So if you think you're, you oh, I'm not good. Pastor, I wandered from the church. I did this, I did that. Jesus doesn't care. What Jesus cares about is the cross. And the cross says you are saved if you believe. You must believe. You must believe. The Bible says for freedom we have been set free. You need to believe. You need to choose. I have decided to follow Jesus. Amen. Every day. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. My friends, take care. Have a fantastic week. God bless you, and I love you, and good to see you, friends. I will see you next week. Thank you.